Hello everybody and welcome to lecture number seven. We're now in period four, which covers the years 1800 to 1848. Um, and we're going to be looking at part one of our video lecture in this period. This is going to be starting with Thomas Jefferson's administration. So let's go ahead and get right to it, shall we? All right, so as always, we like to start with a big picture question. We have a brand new picture, big picture question now for uh, period four. And this one will be posted later on in class. It says, the new republic struggled to define and extend democratic ideals in the face of rapid economic, territorial, and demographic changes. So the economy will be growing. We're gonna be talking about something known as the market revolution is gonna take place. America is going to extend its territory. Uh, they're going to get more and more land. And the demographics will change. The, the people, where they live, uh, the type of immigrants that are coming to America. So there's a lot of changes that's coming. And a lot of this is going to really uh, affect how democracy will develop in the United States. Let's look at our three key concepts. And again, these are new key concepts now. Uh, key concept number one, the United States developed the world's first modern mass democracy and celebrated a new national culture while Americans sought to define the nation's democratic ideals and to reform its institutions to match them. So we're going to talk about this starting from the Jefferson's administration and especially to Andrew Jackson and just beyond how a lot of this begins to change in America. Concept number two uh, developments in technology, agriculture, and commerce uh, pre uh, precipitate profound changes in the United States settlement patterns, regional identities, gender and family relations, political power, and distribution of consumer goods. Again, we'll get into this thing known as the market revolution, but there's also going to be a technological revolution and a communications revolution. All of this is going to start happening here in the early 1800s, the early 19th century. Uh, agriculture is going to be very important to us uh, as people begin to move west, move west across the Appalachian Mountains uh, between that and the Mississippi River. And then they start to cross over the Mississippi River. So we'll start to see how people begin to settle in different parts of the country. It begins to create different regional identities. Uh, the role of the family and gender will begin to change. Uh, earlier we were talking in class about the Republican motherhood. Eventually, that will give way to something known as the cult of domesticity, and the role of women will change again, and how women will challenge that. Different political powers, your political parties will be shifting back and forth. Uh, the importance of consumer goods. Uh, co key concept number three talks about uh, the United States' interest in increasing its foreign trade. Uh, China is going to become very important at some point. Expanding its national borders. Uh, war with Mexico is about to come. Uh, isolating itself from European conflicts shaped the nation's foreign policy. Now, in class, we just talked about Washington's farewell address. He warns of entangling alliances. This is going to shape the nation's foreign policy for over 100 years. All right, so these are the key concepts that we will be discussing throughout this period. Let's look again at key concept number one. Uh, if you remember, this one is the one that's talking about the United States developing um, the world's first modern mass democracy, celebrating new national cultures, and that sort of stuff. But let's go a little bit further and talk about the nation's transformation to a more uh, participatory democracy. So we get even further on. Eventually, uh, they start lifting uh, the requirements to vote. Originally, it was white landowning males, but eventually they take away the landowning part. Uh, some states also required you had to belong to a certain religion. Well, they will remove that as well. More people begin to participate in democracy. Even though women can't vote, you will start to see where certain women's movement will develop here in the 1800s, where they actually do have a say in democracy. Uh, debates over federal power will continue. Right now we have the Jeffersonian Republicans, sometimes known as the Democratic Republicans, versus Federalists. But eventually that will develop into Democrats versus Whigs. And then by the Civil War, it'll be Democrats versus Republicans, all right? The, the relationship between the federal government and the state, states' rights versus the federal authority. 
All right, this becomes a whole big battle with slavery always at the center of this. Um, the various branches of government are now going to be fighting each other here in Part B. We see the Supreme Court. We'll talk about this in this particular PowerPoint, how it starts to assert its federal power um, and the rights and responsibilities of individual citizens. Uh, all this is the key concept 4.1, uh, Roman numeral 1, A, B, C, and D here. Uh, you see the institution of slavery becomes very uh, much defined by the South and how they begin to resist the role of the federal government. Their states' rights issues are more important than the federal government. Uh, national and international market economy, that's something we'll talk about later on, but we can see some of the seeds planted here. We're also going to look a little bit at concept 4.3 and get further into this with the Louisiana Purchase. Right, right. If you need to go back to look at what key concept 4.3 it talked about the increasing foreign trade, uh, expanding uh, national borders. Well, the Louisiana Purchase is going to do that for us here. And we'll talk very specifically about that. So this is obviously a testable word, the Louisiana Purchase. In other words, it would show up in a multiple choice test. But let's get into the examples here with Jefferson and what happens with him and his political party. Um, Jefferson was very upset with the Federalists. He felt that they had really stolen the real ideas of 1776, the Declaration of Independence, what a true republic was. And that's why he and his friend James Madison create their first political party, uh, what was known as the Republicans. I like to call them the Jeffersonian Republicans. Uh, the Federalists uh, were developed by Andrew, uh, I'm sorry, Alexander Hamilton. Of course, he's going to be out of the picture politically, and it gets down in 17. 96, the contest is between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. John Adams wins that election, but Jefferson came in second, so he became the vice president, which basically meant John Adams had a horrible presidency. So the election of 1800 comes around, and Jefferson will win that election. Now in class, we talked about something that's in the Constitution, something that is a compromise during the constitutional convention that gave the South a lot of power. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. You're thinking about it. I bet some of you are already thinking what it is. If you guessed the three-fifths compromise, you would be right. The three-fifths compromise basically helps put Jefferson in the White House in 1800. Uh, he's going to restore the new republic or go back to what is the principles of the republic and there's all these other things he's going to do. But the interesting thing about his election of 1800, it's, it's known as a peaceful transfer of power. In other words, the Federalists are now out of power. Not only do they lose the presidency, but they lose the Senate and they lose the House of Representatives. And they didn't fight over this. They're angry. They're going to be very angry, but they don't go to war over this. America has a peaceful transfer of power from the Federalist government to now a Jeffersonian-based Republican government. And some more examples of Jefferson. Um, now, he did not throw out all the various Federalists that were in the various different offices and uh, the bureaucracy that forms in Washington, D.C., but he does throw some of them out. One thing you have to understand about how political parties work at this time period, there's no television, there's no computers, there's no way to call someone on a telephone, so something is developed during this time period called party patronage. This becomes very, very important. You have now various men in the various states are becoming Republican, whereas the Federalists are primarily located in the New England states. Republicans are going to be spread out in the North, in the South, and eventually in the West as well. Tennessee and Kentucky become known as the Western states at this time period. Party patronage kept them together. In other words, give a little bit of an example here. You're some little guy living in some little town in Tennessee, and you want to make sure that Republicans win the election. So you go out and you help campaign hard for uh, state representatives to, for Tennessee, maybe a local mayor in Tennessee in the town you're in. Maybe you even help run a campaign for Thomas Jefferson while living in your little town in Tennessee. For doing that, 
They're going to reward you, party patronage. They're going to give you some kind of a federal job, working in the post office, working as a tax collector, whatever it is. They'll give you some kind of a job to work within the government for your loyalty. And this is what helped keep political parties loyal because Jefferson cannot possibly travel through all the states and speak with all these people individually. So party patronage is going to be very, very important. It's going to be a concept I'll talk a lot about because eventually, well, it becomes corrupt. It becomes very corrupt here within, a, within several decades, and we'll talk about that. The other thing is the Federalists, as we just said, they lost so much in this election of 1800, they began to fall apart as a political party. They're only going to last about another 16 years, and even in that 16-year run, they're going to have very little power, very little say in government. Something's got to keep the Republicans united. Once your enemy is gone, it's hard to keep Republicans thinking the same way. And eventually the Republican Party will split because of this. And we'll talk about that later on. Now, Jefferson, being a, a fiscal responsible kind of guy, believes that the government got too big. So first thing he does is he cuts military spending. He reduces the, na the nation's debt from 83 to $45 million dollars. And he cuts all the taxes on whiskey. And I know people just must have loved the idea that uh, Jefferson is going to save so much money that because he's going to cut all the taxes there on whiskey. But it's going to come to hurt him in the long run. Uh, I knew eventually my whiskey people would be upset about this. But in the long run, it, it, it's going to reduce the debt. However, when America in a few decades goes to war, they're going to really wish they had that money. All right, the Louisiana Purchase. Now remember, this is a testable uh, subject. I can put this on a multiple choice test for you. What happens, Jefferson winds up doubling the size of the United States literally overnight. Well, I won't say literally overnight, but very close to this. What had happened was the United States won it the right to trade in this area in New Orleans. So various men were sent to France. Now Napoleon controls France at this time period to negotiate the rights to New Orleans. In fact, they're thinking about buying it. Maybe for about $10 million, they'll purchase New Orleans. Well, Napoleon is fighting wars all over Europe. I mean, the guy just likes a good war. And he has lost a war in Haiti. It's cost him millions of dollars. He's lost uh, troops. And he needs cash. And he needs it fast. So when the Americans come to him with this offer, he starts to negotiate, why not all of Louisiana for $15 million? Roughly speaking, that's about 15 cents an acre. Now let me ask you something. If somebody was offering you an acre of land for 15 cents, you think you're going to take it? Of course you're going to take it. You're going to take it with a big old grin on your face. And this is what Jefferson winds up doing. Now, now there's obviously a lot of other things to this. There's these men. James Monroe, for instance, is the ambassador to France who's helping to negotiate this. Um, he's actually Secretary of State, I should say. Uh, Livingston, I believe, was the ambassador to France. There's a lot of involvement, but the thing I want you to understand here, we've mentioned before the concept of strict construction, loose construction. How do you interpret the Constitution? Jefferson and his Republican Party believe in a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Here is the problem. Where in the Constitution does it allow you, as President of the United States, to negotiate treaties to purchase land? Jefferson is very torn over this. He knows this is a great, great deal for the United States. But he's also worried that he can't get it done. If he brings it to Congress and Congress starts to now form committee after committee and they investigate, they want to go out there and look at the land, they want to send their own people to Napoleon, Napoleon's probably going to say no to the deal. It's going to take way too long. So Jefferson kind of swallows a little bit of his constitutional scruples, his principles, and he goes ahead and he purchased the land anyways. He becomes a loose constructionist instead. 
of uh, his strict constructionists. And once the, um, once the Federals find out that he does this, they think they can use this against him. But you just doubled the size of the United States overnight without a war. America is going to be so happy over this that in 1804, Jefferson will easily win his reelection. So Louisiana purchase doubles the size of America. Nobody dies. We got it for 15 cents an acre. Yes, Jefferson had to give up some principles on, on constitutionality of it. But hey, we got land. Well, one other quick thing we'll go over and a good example here, and this goes back to concept 4.1, our first concept, uh, Roman numeral I, letter D, uh, talking about you know, the Supreme Court exerting itself. Mulberry versus Madison was probably the most important court case ever, but you notice I have this as an example, because for some reason, College Board decided this is not a testable item, but uh, it could very well show up in a uh, essay or in one of our short answers. It is actually very important. Um, when the Federalists lost everything, when they lost the presidency in 1800, when they lost the House of Representatives and the Senate, they decided in their infinite wisdom that they would pass the Judiciary Act of 1801, increasing the number of federal judges in America. And guess what? Every one of these federal judges are going to be a Federalist. They even added more judges to the Supreme Court, and they appointed John Marshall, who was the current Secretary of State under John Adams, they appointed him the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Jefferson will denounce this law. He says this law is unconstitutional. But here's the problem. Who gets to decide if a law is unconstitutional? The President of the United States? Congress or the Supreme Court? Up until now, the Supreme Court had been very, very weak. I won't go into all the details about this. I may do a little something in class instead. But basically, the Supreme Court will get to rule in this matter. John Marshall becomes one of our strongest chief justice of the Supreme Court ever. And we're going to talk about several of his cases uh, over the next 30 years. The man will be the chief justice from 1801 to 1830 at his death. Um, this gave the Supreme Court the power of judicial review. When there's a conflict between Congress and the Constitution, the Constitution must prevail, and only the courts can decide that. Only the courts can decide if a law is constitutional or not. That's what judicial review is, and John Marshall gave that power to the Supreme Court. Jefferson has a win-lose situation here. All right, and like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about this in class later in the week. But you, one thing I want you to know is that judicial review. Funny thing with Jefferson, he cuts the military, he cuts a lot of spending, but the world is a harsh place. The British and the French are harassing American shipping constantly. Merchant ships, right? Uh, ships that are only for trade. They're doing something called impressment. I mentioned this once before. We're going to talk a lot about it leading up to the War of 1812, where both the French and the British get onto American merchant ships and they impress sailors or force them to join their navy. If they refuse, they send them back to their country and put them in prison for the rest of their life. George Washington declared neutrality. He tried to negotiate a treaty known as Jay's Treaty to try and stop that, but that didn't work. Now here we, then John Adams, he went to war with the French over the issue, um, a quasi-war, an undeclared war, but it doesn't go away. Now Jefferson inherits this problem as well. The French are impressing our sailors. The English, well, the English decide to go after an American naval ship, the Chesapeake, right? The USS Chesapeake is a ship of war. It's an American ship of war. And at the HMS, His Majesty's Service, Leopold, a bigger ship comes up on this ship and orders it to strike its colors, in, or, in other words, to surrender. Of course, this is an American naval ship. It refuses, and the Leopold opens fire upon the Chesapeake. 
killing a few American sailors, wounding the captain. Then they board the ship and they take several sailors that they declare were runaway British sailors and impress them back into their Navy. And they sail away, leaving the USS Chesapeake wounded and floating, basically. It's got to repair itself and it comes back into America. When people find out about this, they want war. They want Jefferson, American naval honor has been disgraced. They want Jefferson to declare war. Jefferson doesn't like war. Plus, he likes the French. He doesn't really like the English. So instead, he declares an embargo act. This is our key concept one, Roman numeral I, letter C, is where this comes from. This would be an example, an embargo. He declares that he will not trade anymore with the rest of Europe, France, England, and everybody else. He believes that Europe is, is totally dependent upon American goods, and he's wrong. This only hurts the American economy, where he soars in popularity with the Louisiana Purchase. His popularity begins to crash with the Embargo Act. Uh, the Federalist Party especially, which is mostly in New England, and they depend heavily on trade with the British, they come to hate this law. They call it the Oh Grab Me, which is embargo spelled backwards. Oh, this cursed Oh Grab Me. And that's Jefferson writing a turtle, a terrapin turtles, Maryland, Virginia, right? That's probably the connection there. That's a British flag in the background. The, the Federalists want to trade. This would be a Federalist wanting to trade with the British and Jefferson stopping them. And this becomes a thorn of contention for the Federalists. And they try to use this to win the election of 1808. It's not going to work. James Madison, uh, Jefferson's successor, becomes the new president. And the Federalists lose even more power. All right. We're going to end it there. And for further reading, please turn to your textbook. Page 212 talks about the election of 1800, or as Jefferson called it, the Second Revolution. Pages 217 to 223, you start with the Jefferson presidency, and you go through the subheading embargo of 1807. So political cartoon over here, that's Lewis and Mayweather, right? They're the guys who, Lewis Clark and Mayweather, oh man, I'm getting that name all mixed up in my head. But they're the guys who uh, surveyed the Louisiana Territory. All right. Eh, thought you liked that. All right. See everybody later. Bye-bye.